And now, if you're comfortable with it, I want to invite you to pray. Uh, Open up the, the palms of your hands, and let's invite the Holy Spirit to come. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of the faithful, and speak to us today. May we hear from you. May we know that we are cared about and that we are loved and that you are amongst us. Lord, I especially want to pray for anybody that's struggling today. And I pray that they would feel your presence and they would know beyond a shadow of doubt that you are with them. Lord, I also pray for my words today and that my words would ring with the truth of your great love that you have for each and every one of us. Use me, Lord, despite me. It's in your name we pray. Amen. So sometime over the summer, when it wasn't in in single digits, amen, or in the teens, uh, I was over in the Kroger Shopping Center, and uh, I don't know if you know that, but they they have this um, ice cream place over there, uh, Cold Stone Creamery. Say amen if you can. Yes. And so, wow, that's like the most loud amen I've gotten. Um, And so I was driving around, and... um, and I said, uh, and I prayed a prayer. I said, God, I want ice cream, but I'm only going to get ice cream if there is a front row parking spot. The cold's going to cream me. <laughs> and so I prayed that prayer, and you wouldn't believe it. The fifth time I drove around, <laughs> there was a front row spot. It must have been God's will, right? It wasn't God's will the first time, the second time, the third time, the fourth time, or the fifth time, or the fourth, but the fifth time it was. You know, um, God's will is a very interesting term, and sometimes, you know, we say it's God's will that we are here, God's will that we are there, but I, I have friends, and I've had people that struggle with the idea of God's will. And so while God's will might not be a dirty word to you, it might be a dirty word for others. Let me just give you a couple of examples. Um, I have a friend um, who, when he was in college, his dad uh, got cancer and he died. And a well-meaning Christian went to him and said, you know, this was God's will. This was God's plan. And their hope was to try to bring comfort, but they actually did the opposite. And it kind of imparted, impacted his life, and he stepped away from faith in a large part because he he couldn't reconcile that. Like, um, if it was God's will, that means God might not be the loving God that I've been told that God is, right? Um, Think about the uh, tsunami, uh, the one that hit Japan, uh, the one that hit Thailand, uh, you know, many years ago, and the hundreds of thousands of people that died. I believe in the one Like in 2004, it was 225,000 people died. And there were people that said, that's God's will. People, while some of us might not have a think of uh, God's will as a dirty word, sometimes we do think of it as a dirty word because it can really impact our faith. It can cause us, instead of drawing us closer to God, it can push us further from God. Maybe you've heard the expression, it happens, it all happens for a reason. It was part of the plan. It must be God's will. We hear these things, and sometimes it can be helpful. But other times we say these type of things that can actually draw a wedge between ourselves and God. Because how could a loving God do something so horrific? And so that's the light topic we're going to talk about today, amen? (laughs) And so we're going to start a little bit, a little bit of church history. Up on the screen is a picture of John Calvin. Uh, John Calvin was a reformer. Uh, he, uh, one of the great reformers, probably one of the three or four great reformers. He lived from 1509 to 1564. He was born in France in the last decade or so. Uh, he was in the Netherlands. Uh, and he wrote a very important book called The Institute of Christian Religion. The Institutes of Christian Religion. It's often called just The Institutes. And it's a very thick book. I had to read some of it for a seminary. Luckily, I didn't have to read the whole thing. Amen. He wrote the first edition of this when he was 27 years old, and throughout the rest of his life, he kept updating it. 
Now, much of what is written in this very big book, Methodist, uh, myself, and maybe most of you would agree with probably 80 to 90 percent of what's written in this book by John Calvin. But there are some fundamental premises and ideas that I have problems with, and I believe most Methodists have problems with. And the problem is around the idea of God's, the will of God and God's sovereignty. Can you guys say sovereignty? God's sovereignty is about God's power and rule. And uh, what he was saying is God answers to no one. God can do whatever God wants to do. God has the ability to do anything. And if you're a Christian, you most likely believe in God's sovereignty. I believe in God's sovereignty. God is the highest authority. Uh, Jesus is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. But Calvin takes this and he runs with it. And in many ways, it's like he takes God's sovereignty. It's like God's sovereignty is on steroids. This is, what, um, this is one thing. God is in control of every detail. I got a couple of quotes for you from the, institution, from the institutes. Here we go. Here's the first one. If one falls among robbers or ravenous beasts, if a sudden gust of wind at sea causes a shipwreck, if one is struck down by the fall of a house or a tree, it should be known all events whatsoever are governed by the secret counsel of God. So this is something that he says. Every little detail, everything that happens is dictated by God. Here's another quote. This is about hurricanes and storms and those type of things. With regard to intimate objects, again, we must hold that, there, that though each is possessed of its particular properties, yet all of them exert their force only in so far as directed by the immediate hand of God. Nothing happens without his counsel. Now, you hear this, and yeah, God's in control. I'm good with that. I subscribe to that. But what this says is, is that we are not in control of what we do. I did not choose what I wore today. God picked out this nice new shirt, amen? This Christmassy shirt. And knew that I was going to be wearing it before I was even born. It also says God is directing weather. The earthquake that killed thousands, God directed this. You getting stung by a bee four months ago, that was directed by God. God is controlling and dictating everything. We are saying that God is responsible for the things that we would arrest other people for. What do I mean by that? Think about the Holocaust. Six million Jews were killed. God okayed that. Murder, the abuse of children, the list goes on. And what can happen is, is that this can pull people apart from God. And this is how God's will can be a dirty word, because how can God do that, but at the same time be compassionate, loving, and kind? How can you reconcile those two things? And instead of turning to God, people will turn away from God sometimes because of this. There are other people that are perfectly good with this arrangement, by the way. And so what happened is, is that uh, Calvin wrote this, and then some people started to push against it, including this guy, uh, Jacob um, Arminius. You can see a picture of him. I'm going to wear that collar next week, by the way. <laughs> and he kind of came after Calvin and John Wesley, the founder of the Methodist Church, started to follow this guy's beliefs. And he talked a little bit more, a lot more about free will. And so we're going to talk about God's will today. And we're going to talk about two ways to think about God's will. And I'm probably, I'm going to focus more on one than the other. And also, I just want to encourage you to push back against me as well, because there are some, John Calvin typically is connected with the Presbyterian denomination of the church. And there very well might be some Presbyterians in our congregation today that um, might be more okay with what John Calvin is talking about than what I am. And so if you disagree, I'm, I'm totally fine with that, and I hope you'll, you'll push me back. Maybe send me an email. We have a conversation. We can talk about it. 
But I think that in most things, John Calvin is right, but I think in the area of God's will, he is not. So, this is what I want to do in thinking about God's will. Let me show you a book. This book, if you can see it, is the story of my life by God. All right? You open it up, and every page is filled. Every page is filled. And not only, and this is the book of your life story, the story of my life, and this book was written before we were even born. And look at this. On page 151, Gordon would wear khaki pants, <laughs> blue shoes, and whatever plaidish um, flannel shirt to church on February or January 21st. So that's one way to think about God's will. But there's another way to think about God's will. And that's the story of my life by God and me. And in this book, all the pages are blank. Except for the ones that have already happened in my first 50 years of living. And seeing God this way is seeing God as collaborating with you. And so what I want us to do is to think about, when we think about God's will, is I don't want to think about things that have already been determined, but I want us to think about God and us collaborating on our story. Now, um, if you people co-write books sometimes, right? And sometimes it's this person's experience, and sometimes it's the other person's experience. And I really think our life is kind of a combination of those things. There are times, sometimes where God is leading and God is directing us. But then there's sometimes where we're leading and sometimes we're leading in the wrong way, right? But the main thing that I want us to hear is that we are collaborating, that God is collaborating with us. And so we're going to talk about this for the last few minutes. And so uh, the first thing I want to talk about is that God is collaborating with us, is to think about God as parent, God as a parent. Now, we need to remember that all metaphors fall short, right? But some metaphors are good. And so the first one I want to talk about is God as parent. My wife and I, Leanne, we have four daughters. Praise be to God. I believe we, along with God, were responsible for their birth. All four have our DNA and personality traits from each of us. Uh, that The good and the bad, right? Our will is that they have faith in Jesus, that they love others, that they have friends, that they have integrity and character, and that they seek to make a difference with their life. Our will is that they have joy and happiness. This is our desire for them. This is what we want. But guess what? No matter how much we want that, what can't we do? We can't force it upon them. It'd be great if you could force your children to be joyful, right? And sometimes we try that. We hope we have given our daughters the tools to make wise decisions, particularly the older they get. And we hope we've shaped their values in positive ways. And we will always love and support them. Part of the joy of parenting is watching your children make good decisions, amen, or the right decisions. Where you didn't have to tell them what to do, but they just naturally did it. What if God's plan for our lives, instead of being predetermined, set of specific actions, were more like that of a heavenly parent? God's will may have less to do with whether we take this job or do that, but it might be more about seeking to love God and to love our neighbor. And that's what I think God's will is like. God's intention is that our story be about redemption and love and faith and courage. And there are twists and turns in the story. And there are times when we take the story in a direction where God would not choose. There are chapters where we do all the writing. But the best chapters in which we hear God's inspiration and ideas and we write that story together. And so that's the first way I want you to think about God's will. It's that God is a parent, and we are the children. Second way to think about uh, our collaboration with God is God's prescriptive will. 
Can you guys say that with me? God's prescriptive will. Think of a doctor's prescription. A prescription is a, an instruction given by an authority, often written and usually aimed at bringing about an improved state, right? A prescription uh, from the doctor could be a script for medicine along with instructions about how to take it. It could be something from a therapist about how to rehab a, a particular arm or leg or something like that. Uh, it could be uh, something aimed at make, getting your cholesterol lower, uh, about eating something better, uh, about improving your wellness. Your financial advisor might give you some advice, um, a prescription on how to spend and invest your money. God's prescriptive will is the instruction God has given us that will lead us to greater spiritual and relational health. Think about the scriptures, right? Think about the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments are, are guides to help us to thrive, to help us to live. Think about the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5, 6, and 7. This is Jesus' idea about how we can love God and how we can love others. Um, and Jesus summarizes all these things with that, right? To love God and to love others. Our scripture today, the one from Colossians, Paul tells us about God's prescriptive, prescriptive, prescriptive will in our passage. Look at what he says. Because of this, since the day we heard about you, we haven't stopped praying for you and asking you to be filled with the knowledge of God's will. And so learn about God's will with all wisdom and spiritual understanding. We're praying this so that you can live lives that are worthy of the Lord and pleasing to Him in every way by producing fruit in every good work and growing in the knowledge of God. The purpose of knowing God's will, according to Paul, is that we might live lives worthy of the Lord, and that we might grow in the knowledge of God. We begin to see God's will less as God's specific plan in every situation, and more as God's timeless will for how we make each decision, and how we face life every day. And this helps us to, to see things. Adam Hamilton, uh, the pastor of a church in uh, Kansas City, uh, Kansas, uh, he wrote a book called Why. And it talks about God's will in this book. And he shares this story. Our oldest daughter, Danielle, spent the first year of her marriage with her husband, JT, working in South Africa on various projects serving the poor. During part of their time in South Africa, they served a hospice center for persons dying of AIDS. One day, Dan, Danielle and a colleague decided to take those residents of the hospice center who could travel to get ice cream at a nearby Kentucky Fried Chicken. I had no idea Kentucky Fried Chicken had ice cream. <laughs> Say amen if you can, right? The residents were grateful to take the field trip and look forward to their ice cream. Danielle and her co-worker had very little money, but they had enough to buy each patient a single ice cream cone. As the hospice residents sat eating their ice cream cones, an African man approached my daughter saying, what are you doing for these sick people is beautiful. I would like to buy them chicken if that's okay. And this man who did not appear to have a great deal of money proceeded to buy chicken for each of the hospice residents. For most of the residents, this would be the last time they would ever eat fried chicken and ice cream. But in that moment, there was great joy. Sometimes the will of God looks like a man who sees 10 dying AIDS patients and takes the little money he has to buy them each a piece of chicken at Kentucky Fried Chicken. That's God's prescriptive will, prescriptive will. The last way to look at God's will is, as God, is, is, uh, is thinking about coincidence or God incidents. Have you heard of that expression before? Is this a coincidence or this God or a God incident. It's helpful for me to, rem to remember that mine is not the only story God is authoring, amen? God's not only authoring my story, but it's also authoring your story. I'm part of a much larger story of God's love and care for the world. God is working in the lives of the people that we meet each day, seeking to collaborate in writing their stories as well. This helps me to remember that the world does not revolve around me, amen? The man who bought the AIDS patient chicken seems to me to have been part of God's redemptive work that day. He may or may not have realized God was prompting him, but I believe it was God who nudged him and who touched his heart. In turn, he became an instrument of God in that moment. And this is part of God's will. But for this to happen, our eyes need to be open. 
Since the uh, pandemic started, like the week after it started, I started doing a Facebook prayer time. Um, originally, we were doing it two or three times a day, I think. Uh, and uh, we're now still doing it uh, one time a day. We usually do it 8 o'clock. Monday through Friday, typically. Uh, we usually take one of those days off. Um, and um, it's been just a rewarding for me and for the people that are able to participate in that. Um, and each day, at the end of the prayer time, after we do the prayers, I have this thing, and I say, you know, and um, be loved today. Do the most loving thing you can do. At every opportunity, do the most loving thing that you can do. And this has become, become kind of a mantra for this group, to be loved, to do the most loving thing we can do every day. And so this year for Christmas Eve, um, I'm sure you guys remember the sermon because it was just so amazing, right? Uh, at Christmas Eve, one of the things I talked about was doing the most loving things. And so um, I, I did that, and I talked about this, uh, this middle school girl named Trinity, and this middle school girl named Trinity decided to get cards for people to put on people's cards so that they would know that they were loved by God. And so, knowing that, I want to read this email to you. We are inspired by the Christmas service message and the story about Trinity's God-dropping idea about printing prayer cards to place on cards. We wanted to extend the spirit of Christmas season and to give the members of Woodlake United Methodist Church these bands to have a physical reminder of Pastor Gordon's message, do the most loving thing you can do. We hope these will be a blessing for the church, as this community has been such a blessing to us. And so she got me probably 500 or so, whoever the family was, they got me 500 or so of these bracelets that say, do the most loving thing. If you want to do God's will... I think the best question that you can ask is what's the most loving thing I can do? Don't be concerned that this is the right decision or the right decision, but if you boil it down to that one thing, what's the most loving thing I can do? You will most likely be doing God's will. Amen? And so that's the next step for today is to simply do the most loving thing. And if you want one of these bracelets, um, the ushers will be handing them out as you exit today. But I invite you to take one of these, and I simply invite you to ask that question each and every day. What's the most loving thing I can do? I want to close by reading the Romans passage. Again, this is Paul, and he's talking about um, just, I'll just go ahead and read it and tell you that later. So Paul's brothers and sisters, because of God's mercy, I encourage you to present your bodies as a living sacrifice that is holy and pleasing to God. God wants us to, to love each other, to love God and to love others, and to, be, to, and to be a living sacrifice. This is your appropriate priestly service. Do not be conformed to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds so that you can figure out what God's will is, God's good, pleasing, and perfect will. I invite you to take one of these bracelets. And even if you don't take a bracelet, I invite you to do God's will by doing the most loving things possible. Amen? Let's pray. Most gracious and loving Lord, we thank you for loving us. And Lord, sometimes it can be so easy to get wrapped up in what is God's will for us. Should I do this? Should I do that? Should I go here? Should I go there? And Lord, while those things are super important, when it comes to doing God's will, the most basic, simple thing we can do is to simply do the most loving thing. As we leave this place today, may we do your will by doing the most loving thing that we can do. It's in your name we pray. Amen.